Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined today from Argentina by Lorena Julio, who is the co-founder of Compalente Foundation. We, we previously interviewed your, your co-founder, uh, Sebastian Flores, but mm -hmm. uh, I had the pleasure to meet you both in uh, Buenos Aires last summer when we were still allowed to travel um, at, at the uh, Cumbre Mundial Discapacidad. So, uh, which was a, a fantastic global summit on, on disability, which was hosted by uh, Vice President Michetti. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the background that led you to, to start Compalante and, and sort of how you came to work in, in, in the field of disability inclusion? Okay, hi. Well, thank you for this conversation. I feel really honored to be here. Uh, well, about me, uh, I'm a journalist by degree, you know, I study like uh, social communication and I have a master in public policies. And in 2014, I was working in Washington DC at the Organization of American State uh, in the area of the, the, uh, the use, you know, the Young America's Business Trust. I was leading a network of young leaders and young entrepreneurs, you know. And actually, I felt inspired by all these entrepreneurs, and I decided to start my own project, you know. <laughs> it was on my 19, 29 years old, and I decided, okay, let's uh, start something new, something innovative. And what made me feel really bad at that time was uh, the difficulties that blind people has in Latin America to access to education. For me, it was uh, an injustice that people with disabilities cannot access to education. Mainly, I was focused on blind people. That's why I decided to start an audiobook bank. You know, at that time, I was working in Washington, surrounded by people from different countries, and I thought it was easy. I asked to my friend from Brazil, please record an audiobook with your phone in Portuguese. Uh, my friend from Canada in French, my friend, all people from different parts of the world. So in a short period of time, we achieved 400 audiobooks in 18 different languages. So that was the, let's say, the starting point of Fundación Comparlante, which is the organization that I lead with uh, Sebastian Flores from Ecuador. So, yeah, I feel that that was, it was like the injustice, you know, why we cannot access to the same opportunities. Why uh, people in Latin America uh, uh, suffer all these barriers to access to education. Let me tell you at that time, according to the World Bank, only the 20% of the kids with disabilities access to education. This is terrible. This is terrible because this, whole, this all have a negative impact in their adult lives. They cannot access to a job. Not even a decent job, a job, you know, like the 90% of the adults in Latin America, adults with disabilities are out of the workforce. So that was the main motivation, but I define myself as a human rights advocate. I have been working in the, this field for the last 14 years. Uh, I work in Argentina for the government of the province of Buenos Aires in the human rights ministry uh, in press and communication, always related to communication, no? But um, yeah, and this year I joined a global peace campaign, which is called Jai Jagard. It's a global movement. So I joined this uh, march because one of the main pillars of this march was non-discrimination. Okay. The first one was eradication of poverty. The second it was action against climate change. The third was eradication of poverty. And the last one um, is uh, promoting peace and non-violence because this march is um, built uh, because of the anniversary, the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. So in different uh, ways, I've been always connected to 
uh, human rights and now focus on uh, people with disabilities, uh, equality, inclusion and accessibility. Excellent, thank you. And uh, I, I was really quite sincerely impressed by the sort of forward thinking and progressive approach taken by the Argentine government around inclusion of, 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 of disabled people. Um, of course, there's the acknowledgement that, that as a, a developing economy, there's more to do. By the way, even the largest economies have tons more to do. So, um, I, I, but I was genuinely impressed by the the, the humanity of the the approach by government uh, and the 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 big tent approach. If you if, if you understand my meaning, that that everybody. You know, what was great about the Cumbre Mondial was the fact that it was a massive celebration. It wasn't just, oh, we're going to have a really dry conference about uh -huh. disability. It was you know, a celebration where everyone was welcome, everybody was able to participate, and, and it was joyous. And, and quite often, where we go to conferences in Deborah and I, up until this year, went to a lot, there's not often that joy. Uh, there's a lot of, of, of seriousness, a lot of uh, discussion about how we can make stuff better and how bad stuff is. But actually, um, I was really struck by the positive approach. And, and I think that, that that's also reflected by the work that you're doing with Comparante, right? So. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, 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 the aspects that you're working on now with, with the foundation? Um, and because I, I know that you're also interested in entrepreneurship still and supporting entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, Fundación Comparlante is a nonprofit organization that works in Latin America. We have our office in Argentina, in La Plata, and also in Washington DC, but our programs are uh, focused on Latin America, no? not only in Argentina, also Sebastián is in Ecuador and our team, we are 10 young leaders from seven different countries in Latin America. So our programs are um, always thinking in a regional way. No? Um, so Fundación Comparlante promotes the rights and the development of people with disabilities. And we are mainly focused in three pillars. The first one is accessibility. Here we offer products and services, let's say consultancies for governments, you know, because it's the right uh, of the people to access to education, information, opportunities, you know, sports, everything. Uh, also to um, companies, you know, if you are a company, you want to sell more, okay, you should be accessible to, uh, to reach more people and to sell more and to earn more money. It's uh, <laughs> as easy as that. And of course, with professionals, you know, one of the main um, uh, topics of our organization or the strong one is uh, web accessibility. You know, we promote uh, the importance of uh, web accessibility. Nowadays, it's uh, quite clear the importance of web accessibility because under the lockdown, everything happened online. We study online, we do shopping online, we ask for food online, everything happened online. But what happened with blind people? Can they access to that information? Can they access to all that content? That's not possible. We all know that it's not possible because the 90% of the content on the internet is not accessible for them. So we promote uh, accessibility, web accessibility um, as a tool, but also as a right. And the second pillar of Fundación Comparlante is art. Why? <laughs> Why art? No? Because for us, art is a tool to create awareness. We develop different uh, awareness campaigns to sensitize the non-disabled people about the capabilities of people with disabilities. What we want is to change the focus. Instead of seeing what they cannot do, we look the possibilities, the capabilities, what they can do, you know? 
um, we uh, had really good uh, impactful programs under this pillar. Last year, we uh, developed a photo um, exhibition called We Feel. We Feel portrays people with disabilities doing activities in fullness, you know, to show what they can do. Let me share with you shortly, briefly, an uh, experience that I had in India. I was in India uh, with two friends there, the one uh, around 23 years old and the other 26 years old. The 26 years old girl, uh, she is blind. So the, um, the one girl asked to the blind girl if she uh, menstruate, you know, do you have menstruation? She asked to the blind if she has menstruation. And we say, what? What's the relation between blindness and menstruation? So that made me think, okay, we need to talk about this. There's a lot of ignorance regarding to people with disabilities. And this ignorance, this lack of information is what makes that, that promote stereotypes, negative stereotypes, no? So that's why we decided to um, do this program, which is called We Feel. And what's amazing, for example, we portrayed a blind person, which is, um, he has a radio show. Why not? Why not? He's blind. He can talk. He can listen. He can, like, manage a radio show. And all the people who visit the exhibition was, wow, how can this be possible? It's simple. It's possible. That's the reality of people with disabilities. The problem is that we only see what they cannot do. And I think that that was the, the, the impactful um, part of this program. We exhibit this uh, We Feel uh, exhibition at the summit. You saw that in, in our stall. Um, uh, that was a really good one. I feel that that's the main point with art. It's a soft way to create awareness. We already participate at president summits. Uh, we went to the UN writing the declaration of people with disabilities. You know, government people read the document and say, okay, we will do, and nothing happened. But if we came to them with a soft tool, which art works, because we, we saw that it works, um, and so that's why we decided to have this second pillar. And the third one is entrepreneurship. As I told you, the 90% of the adults with disabilities in Latin America, according to the World Bank, are out of the, are, uh, the workforce. Okay, entrepreneurship is about independence. It's about an autonomous life. It's about dignity, you know? So what we promote is uh, <coughs> to develop um, different small business like startup for people with disabilities. Also in Ecuador, we are working with mothers of kids with disabilities because we understand that it's quite hard to take care of your kids and also to uh, go outside your home to, to work. So that's why uh, also entrepreneurship is a really uh, important tool to promote uh, independence. No? And now, under this coronavirus situation, we are offering uh, webinars every Wednesday, and we have like 100, 150 participants each session, because people are really interested in, in participate. They need this kind of tool, how to make a business model, how to understand my ecosystem, uh, my business ecosystem. Uh, last week was about how to build accessible documents, you know? Okay, if you are a business person and you want to reach more people, okay, your documents, your events, everything should be accessible. So right. we are trying to make a, a bridge between all this information and these tools which are available, you know? But sometimes- I have a question. 
I, sorry, I have sorry. a question yeah. for you. No, I, I just, I want, I, you've drew, you're doing so much, but we, we want to ask you some questions. So when you, when you talk about what you're doing, which is powerful and amazing, and um, I, my chief financial officer is in Costa Rica, and we met when UNESCO brought over six of the, I'm, uh, six of the Central America countries to together to talk about these things. And unfortunately, after the conference really happened, which we see often, as you said, Lorena, but you talk about people that are blind, but are you supporting people with other disabilities or is this focused only for people that are blind? Because of course we know people with disabilities come in all shapes and sizes. And um, in there, in, 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 as you break the categories down, certainly there are different needs behind it. But I also um, applaud something that you said multiple times, which let's focus on somebody's abilities because we all have disabilities. We all have, you know, negatives, um, but it, but we also have strengths. So if we're focusing on people's strengths, we allow them to bloom. And I also want to make one more comment for you to think about the, the, the and I know that Antonio talks about this a lot um, on all the social impact work he does, but it's the gig economy. And during the COVID-19 it's become even more of a gig economy where people yeah. really are going to have to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to take care of their families. And so I think what you're doing with the entrepreneurship for people with disabilities, and we've seen other programs um, around the world, but we all three really believe that a lot more needs to be done to support entrepreneurs with and without disabilities. But I was just curious if it, you are focused on just the category of blindness or if it's uh, more in, you know if it's broader than that and either way it's a win I was just curious thank you for that question no, absolutely we start working with people uh, with blind people but nowadays we are like we are more open to different kind of disability because of course when we promote accessibility we want accessibility for all we are talking that we all should enjoy the same right in fullness all and yeah, actually, I think this is in hand with the, our idea of promoting the value of diversity. I mean, that, that's the main point, the value of diversity. Oh, um, so, yeah, we start with blind people, but nowadays we are um, uh, more focused in different uh, kind of disabilities. Yeah, thank you. Antonio, Antonio, you I, think, to say yeah, I think you want yeah. to come in. No, you have you have traveled. You have talked with 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 a, a lot with a lot of people you now from different origins, backgrounds, and uh, and so, and sometimes when we talk about accessibility, we, we tend to focus in the number of countries that they are doing this so well. They were able to solve these problems, but I I would like to know if I want you to look uh, to to your country and what's happening in South America and to reflect what are the things that you are doing really well considering the resources that you have? <laughs> what a tough question. I feel that we are, uh, our laws are in line with the international standards. Uh, I feel that we, in that way, in that uh, uh, specific point, we are good, you know? Now, we need to implement those laws. You know, as Neil say, last year the summit was great, amazing, but what about the follow-up? There's a lot of discussion, you know, people with disability uh, have their own voice here, you know, they can express their opinion, they participate, they are public, um, uh, really active in the public uh, scene, but what about the real change that we all need, you know, because it's not enough to have a law regarding to access to information and web accessibility. This all should be implemented. So, yeah, I, if, comparing to like, I don't know, India or different countries that I've uh, been there for a long period of time, that I meet people and I understand people, um, uh, how they behave and the way of life or all the people, uh, um, different needs, let's say, no? Uh, what I feel, Argentina, India, access to education is the same in all. It's, a, it's, a, it's a still an issue in uh, different parts of the world. It's, uh, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of things to do regarding to education, for example, which is my main motive, you know. Uh, um, but and here in Argentina, I can say that there, we have like positive and proactive uh, laws regarding to right of people with disabilities, but still uh, the implementation, uh, it's a need, no? I, I understand. And, and, and to be honest, that implementation and monitoring in most countries still requires a lot of work. So you're not alone in, in, in thinking that it needs to go further. Uh, we, we all wish for that. Um, I've, I've got a follow up sort of question around education, particularly because you said that education is kind of like the, the, the foundation piece. Mm -hmm. So, and I understand that we, we need to, to educate people with disabilities so that they have access to jobs and opportunities uh, throughout the rest of their lives. When we have such limited resources, because we're all in a time now where we're economically challenged, how do we balance that, uh, that need for building a pipeline of skills against the, the need right now to support the existing population of adults with uh, disabilities who are 90% you know, underemployed? How, how do we balance that? I mean, that's a question I, I ask lots of people, not just for you, but uh, what, what do you think we can do in, in that respect? Uh, for me, the most important uh, thing now is to make people with disabilities visible because they still keep invisible. If there are the... 15% of the population, where are they? At home. And if they're still at home, no one's gonna care. The government doesn't care. That's the reality. They're not gonna change the educational system because, you know, in public, because I, I, I see, yeah, sorry, it's a 15, yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I was, I just wasn't sure if I heard you correctly. I was sorry. Yeah. When she responded. One, five, so one, five, 15, 15 right, percent right. of the population. Yes. But no matter if it's the only percent of the population, the government should give I all agree. the same opportunities. That's what I'm, what I, agree. I mean, you know, that's, They're citizens. that's the main. Yeah, that's, and they yeah. have the right to access to the same opportunities mm -hmm. just because they are human beings. The fundamental right. We talk about education because this is important, you know, and, um, and there's something that should change. We One really thing, need that. Yeah. yeah. One thing Debra. I saw that surprised me because I, um, even though I have team members that are in uh, Latin America and Central America, I still don't, you know, how can you know everything? And so one thing that I was surprised about was in some of the Central American countries that are considered part of the Latin America countries, of course, um, whenever the country, Panama was uh, one of the countries that they, they gave this example, whenever um, the government in Panama went to, to the villages, to people's homes all throughout Panama to, to do a census to figure out how many people are we even talking about here? That's why I was asking you about, you know, the number, because um, how many people were we talking about? Well, there were many families that hid their children with disabilities and would not tell the government about it because they were afraid they were actually very afraid that the government was coming to take their children away from them. And so they hid the children, they hide them away in the homes and they don't let them come out and they don't let them participate in society. And I know this is not just in Panama and this is only in sections of Panama. And by the way, this happening in the United States too. I mean, it's happening in other countries, but it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue of, um, you know, they're not being accepted in society sometimes even by their families. And so their family, and I am a parent of an, an adult daughter with Down syndrome. So I'm one of those parents. And it's, it's really interesting to see how society tried to hold her back. And every time society tried to hold her back, 
I just stepped in fighting like crazy. But at the same time, so that as, and I do want to just mention that Sunday, the United States is going to celebrate the 30th year of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And certainly the, um, and Neil said in the chat window, you're definitely not hiding Sarah. And I'm not, <laughs> as a matter of fact, my daughter Sarah got sick of being on stage. And she's like, mom, mom, I'm just, uh, she actually said this. I'm normal. Stop putting me on stage. It's like, oh my gosh, stop it. So anyway, I, she, she's, she is, she's just, you know, she's like everybody else. But I think the, I think the work that you're doing and that we're all doing, because this is why we do access chat. We do it to try to break down the barriers. Let's have the conversation. Let's have the tough conversations. But we see this happening, Lorena, just everywhere. And it feels that during a time of great crisis, um, that these people get even more disenfranchised. And so I was just curious if you're also seeing that, you know, in Argentina and the other areas um, that you're working in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But the thing is, you are an empowered woman. So you have the tools, you know, to fight for you and your gear. But there's a lot of, well, yeah. I mean, who supports right. families? Who supports families? You say about right. the census. How the government approach these families? And after knowing that these families had a person with disabilities, how they support them after the meeting? Because it's not a number. It's not I came to your house, I knocked the door, ah, you have a wheelchair, okay, one wheelchair user, one more. It's not like that. It's about people. It's about your citizens. Yes. So yes. every time that people question uh, families um, behavior, I ask myself and I ask to others, who supports those people? Who supports the family? Because you, you were born with the, the manual and how to be a good mother, but, you know, and yeah. how to be right. and how to support. There's also lack of information. There's, it's not about lack of love. It's about protection because I protect my kid because I don't want nothing to hurt my kid, right. you know? Right. And, and they look around and they see what, what, what traditionally has happened. I, I just want to make one more comment that I'm being too, too comedy. You know, I'm going to be quiet and let the others talk. But when I, I spoke in Turkey a few years ago and um, I was speaking about my daughter, I'm very proud of my daughter. She's an amazing woman. I'm proud of a lot of the others. And I understand that I have the privilege, might not look very privilegy right now, but I have the privilege of being born in the United States where we're celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was, you know, where we took language from the CRPD. So we've done a lot of amazing things, but we have so much more work to do. But when I was in Turkey, I was talking about how my daughter changed my life. I mean, the way she looks at life has been so empowering. And afterwards, I had multiple mothers come up to me. And, and this hasn't only happened in Turkey, but this just one in Turkey really stood out because it also happened in Qatar and Oman. But they said, it has never occurred to us to think of our children as a blessing. It just never, nobody ever told us that our children are okay. We just fear for our children every day. We don't know how to help them. We don't know where to go. We, we don't know what they could do. That's why, once again, I think the work that, you, uh, that you're doing, it's just, as Sebastian's doing, it's critical because it's sometimes that people don't even understand that it, we could be mm -hmm. proud of who these individuals are, or these individuals could be proud of themselves. And I hope social media and a lot of things, I hope that access chat is contributing to those conversations. But I think sometimes people don't understand that a lot of these families, especially in developing countries and, and in, in beautiful Latin America, that the resources haven't been given to the leaders like you that can really make a difference. We're starting to see it, but it, I think it's hard sometimes for people to understand that these families don't even know where to begin. These individuals with disabilities, they, they've just been told their whole lives that they are just a burden. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, I know yeah. that's what you're saying and I'm going to be quiet, but. Yeah, but that's why it's so important to make them visible, you know? That, okay. Agree, agree. That's the, the first step, you know, to change our mindset, to change our attitude toward disability. We need to make this visible. 
Right. And I think the entrepreneurship thing, that is so powerful. Once again, we, I, did, I wrote an article in the United States recently about TikTok and, you know, it's political, but regardless, platforms like TikTok and YouTube and some of those platforms like that, people with disabilities are really figuring out how to make a good living. I follow a, um, a couple on um, YouTube and they have 800,000 followers and, and they're really, you know, they're uh, entrepreneurs. And so when you start taking apps and things like the platforms away from the people, then, you know, it, you hurt, you know, entrepreneurs with disabilities too. So I think more and more we have to look at how do we, like you said, make people more visible, let people show you what they're capable of. You think I can't do anything? Well, get out of the way and let me show you that type of thing. <laughs> really, really applaud the work that you're doing. Thank you. So Lauren, uh, we're not uh, we're uh, about to close the, the interview, uh, but I, I would like you to update us and those who are listening uh, uh, access chat about what are what are your plans uh, for the rest of the year? What type of activities are you developing? Are comparlante? Uh, uh, what is going on in in your world that is important that you can share with us? Oh, okay, thank you for the question. Well. Uh, now we are uh, near to close our literary contest. We launched in March a literary contest for kids uh, from 6 to 13 years old. So it's called My War, My Way. And we give them like three characters, a girl with uh, cerebral paralysis, a boy with autism, and another girl uh, with amputation. So these little kids, should write a short story and send to us because we have really, really good prizes. <laughs> so in the 31st of July the, um, is the deadline for this contest for kids. Uh, we already received um, stories from seven different countries, so we are really happy. In the first edition in 2017, we got uh, stories from five countries in Latin America and this year we already have seven countries including Spain so we are already in Europe so we are really really uh, happy with the impact of uh, this program because in a way it's an opportunity to talk about disabilities these three kind of disabilities with the families in the first edition, we work closely with the schools. We went there, we promote the program, we explain the disabilities, but now it's impossible due to the lockdown and this uh, COVID situation. So uh, the work was done by social media, working with parents, and I feel that it was a different kind of exercise, but again, the community was involved the families, uh, the, the, the parents and families, the uh, teacher. So I um, really uh, enjoy doing this My War, My Way uh, project. The second one is Startup Ability. As I told you already, it's a series of webinars um, focused on entrepreneurs with disabilities, bringing tools every Wednesday um, we uh, offer these webinars, is an hour, an hour and a half webinars, and you can also check it on our YouTube uh, channel. You find us as Comparlante. In all our social media, you find us as Comparlante. Um, all the sessions recorded are there. All these uh, value resources are uh, there for entrepreneurs. Um, we supposed to launch uh, we feel exhibition, but this year it's a different name. It's called We Feel Diversity. You know, the main point is like, as I told you, like to promote the value of diversity. So the second edition of this photo exhibition is mainly focused on people with disabilities, but uh, LGBTQ uh, community, no? like trans. Um, gays and all the diversity included in our um, photo exhibition. So these are the three main programs that we are working in this year and you can check all the uh, programs, services and products of Comparlante in our website www.comparlante.com 
and follow us on social media to uh, know more about and to join. You know, our foundation is always open to new ideas and new people who wants to work with us. Excellent, thank you. And um, hopefully we'll grow your follower base as part of, um, as part of this exercise. So I, thank you very much, Lorena. It's been a real pleasure interviewing you. I need to thank uh, our supporters too, uh, which are Barclays Access, Microlink and MyClearText for helping keep us captioned. I look forward very much to you joining us on Twitter on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And yeah, well done. let's keep talking about accessibility. <laughs> Work I together. <agree>. We will. <laughs> Thank you.